Lord, we thank you for the privilege and the opportunity, Lord, to, Lord, just lift up your name. I welcome my brothers and sisters who took the time to be here tonight with me, Lord, and my wife, Father God, as we came together as the Mishpaha, the lift up your name, Father. We give you all thanks and gratitude, not just in this holiday season, Lord God, but every day of our lives. We thank you for the privilege to come together and share your word. We thank you for the privilege to come together and hear what you would have us here tonight, Lord. And that you would lead us into that place, that higher level, with deeper roots. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Everybody says, Amen, amen and Amen. Praise you, Lord. Brothers and sisters, thank you, brother. I'm going to continue on the message uh, Sunday that the Lord gave us called Choose This Day for Yourselves, Whom You Will Serve. I want to continue on it because it needs to get into the, the details that, that the Holy Spirit wants you to glean. Because it's more than theology. And what I'm going to be talking about tonight is the fact that when we choose for ourselves who we will serve, it is a daily choice. And in many cases, it is a moment by moment choice. It is, yes, our choice. And we make those choices because we are born again, blood bought children of God. You can't be in the world and choose to serve the Lord because you can't. But as a child of God, we're called to serve the Lord, but we're called to want to serve the Lord. It is a, a, a free choice that God wants us to make because it is involving our love for him as compared to our love for ourselves. Whom do you love the most, God or yourself? Whom do you love the most, your God or, or the world? And I, I believe without a shadow of a doubt that when we understand what the Holy Spirit has placed in my heart to share with you these uh, last notes that I have to share with you, you'll understand why you and I are battling, and more than ever at times, we're battling and you would think the older you get, the less you battle, but I got news for you, the more that you battle. And the, the thing that you battle against the most, regardless of what you think, is your own nature. And I want to prove that to you tonight. And I want to tell you up front that you will battle against your old nature until the Lord takes you home, till you're raptured, or in other words, till you leave this earth. You will battle. There's no way that you can tell me or anybody can tell me that the battle is not real and that your old nature is your greatest nemesis. It is. <coughs> And that is the platform that Satan looks for, is the platform of the fallen nature still left in our heads and unfortunately in our closets. And I want us to understand that so that we know that we are in a battle for life and death. We really are. Choose this day for yourselves whom you will serve. Church, our previous readings were found in Romans 6, 16 through 23, and our text reading was Joshua chapter 24, verses 14 and 15, and our text was verse 15, part B. Remember, choose you this day whom you will serve. And our theme is where are we with our God in the reality of our daily living? Now, I'm not going to go over these things because all of you were here with me Sunday. And if not, you can still see it on the video. I want to move into what God wants me to move into. And that's to understand who it is that we actually are battling. The spirit that we're battling. It is the spirit of Amalek. It is the spirit of the fallen nature. It is the spirit, if you will, that comes from Esau. The spirit that provoked him 
to choose a morsel of bread or to, to gratify his flesh over his birthright. Uh, a lot of people do not believe that these things are pertinent to our walk as a New Testament believer, but I believe that without a doubt, you cannot disassociate yourself with that truth. Because if you, and I'm teaching on typology, which means that I'm using the Old Testament to relate to us in the New Testament. Do, is that important? Yes, it is. Because Paul used the same typology when he spoke about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He used the typology of the people being led out of Egypt, going through the Red Sea, going through the wilderness, drinking of the same spiritual drink, eating of the same spiritual. That is typology. He says these things happen to them for us for an example for us to learn from. And this is how I'm approaching this message tonight that I opened up with Sunday. When I say we hear it all the time, when people, we've all learned the right thing to say, just like a child or a young person learns how to answer in accordance to what we want to hear. But that doesn't make it so. And this is what Joshua was talking about. And when he was addressing the people of God, he said, choose this day whom you will serve. And then he answered for himself. He says, me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now, when he said that, we say that, when we, we say that as a blanket statement. But Joshua was holding them to the grid. He was saying, this is what I say. But he's not talking about the framework of his house. He's talking about his posterity. He's talking about everything that concerns his life. And then he warned them that they couldn't do it because of the type of mindset that they've been walking in the whole time. And you can read that for yourself. Brothers and sisters, where are we with our God in the reality of our daily living? And I want you to put this down as something I've shared with you before, and I think it's pertinent for tonight's message even more so, and that's Numbers chapter 33, verses 50 through 51, and... Verse 53 and 55, it's where the Lord God told Moses to tell the people that when they cross over the Jordan into the land of Canaan, which is the covenant promises of God, the first thing that they needed to do was dispossess the inhabitants of the land. And again, I'm talking uh, in a, a typology type statement, I'm teaching in a typology type way, where as we see these as our examples, spiritual applications to us as a people of God. But you must dispossess before you possess. And then he goes on in these other scriptures that I gave you, and he tells us what happens when we don't. There's three things, three names that I want you to remember off the bat, and that's of course as Esau, as Agag, that's Amalek, there's four names, and the Amalekites. Because you see, they all come from the lineage of Esau. And remember, Esau is the brother of Jacob, who became Israel, right? Mm -hmm. So you see, that right there is a standing battle. Remember, Jacob was afraid to come back to the promised land because he had taken or swindled uh, uh, Esau out of his birthright, but Esau had willingly forfeited his birthright for the gratification of his flesh. So we know that Jacob ran away. We know what happened. Actually, God repaid him for him swindling because he was swindled. As he sowed, he reaped. That's the truth of the matter. And before he was finished with, when he was going back, he had to wrestle and the word of God says he wrestled with a man. Actually, he wrestled with God. And God gave him because he refused to give up. God changed his name from that of Jacob to Israel. And he was able to cross over in the favor of God. Even though Esau remembered quite well what had happened. This is what I want you to understand that there is a battle that is raged against God's people. Now, hear this well. God's people didn't experience the 
Amalekites rage against them until they came out of Egypt, a type and shadow of them being born again. Why? Because they were on the road to sanctification. Why are we battling so much? Because we are on the road of sanctification. It doesn't change. No matter how old you are or how young you are, God has got you on a deep cycle. He wants to cleanse the deepest part. Amen. So as I continue on this word of the Lord today for his church, I want us to know why this is so important. Many times we use God's word, as I said a moment ago, as a blanket statement without understanding the context, the context of what we are saying. Or in other words, what it is that we are saying, just like in our text reading. When we say, as Joshua said, choose you this day whom you will serve, Joshua followed with his answer. That answer that we all give to lightly. But it's for me and my house we will serve the Lord. He was talking metaphorically concerning his posterity and all that it concerned. Most of the time when we make a statement like it, like that, it's because we have learned what to say. But I want you to understand when we make a statement like that, just like Joshua did, it is far more than that. It's a declaration of war. Don't you understand when you say, me and my household, we shall serve. It's a declaration of war. Not only to the world, but your own nature. Because you no longer are going to serve your flesh as a child of God. But when you make that obvious statement, that is a declaration of war. It's the same declaration that God told Saul that from generation to generation he would war against Amalek. Amen? And that's why this message is so important. When it came to how he spoke or who he would serve, when it came to his integrity or who he would serve in his integrity, when it came to his worship, and who he would serve when it came to his faithfulness. And who he would serve and how he would worship and who he would worship. When it came to what he did when he was in the world. Or then who would he serve in the world? Would it be God or man? When it came to his entertainment, who would he serve? God or man? By now you get my drift, right? Who we serve is not a house, it's not a blanket statement. Choose to say for yourself whom you will serve. When you're tempted to be dishonest, choose yourself whom you will serve. When you're tempted to view pornography, choose to say whom you would serve. When you're tempted to be a part of the world like you were before, play around the world with your girlfriends or your boyfriends or your crowd, choose you this day whom you will serve. Because you see, whom you choose you will serve will either be a declaration of war against God or against your flesh. When you choose you, when you serve you, you are declaring that you're warring against God, just like Amalek, Amalek did, or Amalek did, and Hagar did, and Haman did, and Hitler did, and Napoleon did. He was not talking about what we say alone or in the front of many people as much as who he really is and who he really served the most. And that's what this message is about because the world serves the world, the flesh and Satan, because that's who they are. But my question is, so with that logic, who do we serve since we are not of the world, logically speaking? Again, we read... Romans 6.16, it says it plainly, Know you not that whom you ye yield yourselves servants to obey? Listen, whom you yield yourselves servants to obey. It didn't say your servants. It says whom you yield yourselves servants to obey. And that's with your thinking, with your words that you speak, what you watch on TV, who you hang with, whom you yield to, you become servants to is servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin and of death or of obedience unto righteousness. I want us to look at another reading, a new reading that we didn't do Sunday, and it's found in Matthew 7, verses 13 through 29. 
Church, Jesus said in Matthew 7, verses 13 through 29, he said, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. We know that what he's talking about is there's only one way to enter in, and that's through him. He's the way, the truth, and the life. Religion can't do it, but Jesus can. Jesus did, Jesus will. Amen? But he goes further than that. He says, And there are many be which go in therein, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. And then he says something else in verse 15. Beware of false prophets. Now again, Jesus is talking about this in typologies. He says, enter in the straight gate. That's, type, that's a typology. He says, and he shows you, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. That's a typology. And many there be which go in their end. That's typology. And that's what you see in the world. And that's what you see in the church of today. One of the most ludicrous leadings of, of, of Protestant churches today is not is the, the uh, Presbyterian Church, which has become so, so evil in their doctrine. And I don't mind saying it because they started out right. But like so many of them, they have become totally, totally off the charts in what they promote. And it's certainly not God. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing. Again, typology. But inwardly they are ravening walls. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men, and look again. He gives you a word picture, a typology. Do men gather grapes of thorns, or figs, or thistle? Even so good tree bringeth forth good fruit. But a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. But every tree, again, he makes it plain so we have no excuses. It says, every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is cut down. It doesn't stop there. It says not only cut down, but is cast into the fog. Whereby, then he makes the comment, he makes the statement. Whereby, in other words, now you, by what I've been telling you, now you will know them by their fruits. But then he qualifies that. See, this was teachers. And then he breaks it down, not only teachers, but he breaks it down to us. Because we bear fruit in accordance to what and who we serve. Then he breaks it down again and to explanation of that truth to you and I as followers. He said, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, and it's the same thing he said prior to that. Not everybody who's, who's of a religious nature who says, Lord, 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 or said, thus saith the Lord, is going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because it is about fruit. It's about who we serve. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? And in your name have cast out devils? And in your name done many wonderful works. Many wonderful works, not fruit, but works. And when, and then will I profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. We cannot, people cannot fool God. Is primarily what he's talking about. And then the last, the last verses. Jesus not only tells us about leaders that lead us in wrong direction, but he also gives an explanation of that truth. First of all, he gave us the typology about the narrow gate, the straight gate, the narrow gate. Uh, way or the and the broad way, and then he tells us he warns us about false prophets that come to in sheep's clothing, and then he tells us about what those false prophets and what we bear. Either you're a good tree or you're not. What you bear is either good, it's going to acknowledge who you are, and then last but not least, he explains that 
Not in typology, but just straightforward truth. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, 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 shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. That's straight. You don't get any more straight truth than that. But it doesn't leave it that way. It comes right back in verses 24 through 29, and he says this. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, there is your double standard. There is one that is, is solidified in God's word, and there's one that's not. There's no in-between. Shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And it came to pass, when Jesus had ended these sayings, that the people were astonished at his doctrine. Why? For he taught as one having authority and not as the scribes. When he said in Matthew 7 verses 13 through 14, when he said, enter ye in the straight gate, he was talking about the same thing that he said in John 14, 6, when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh the Father unless he come by me. And he was talking about in the verse 15 through, uh, if you will, 20. When he was talking about that, he was primarily talking about John 14, 20 through 24. One was typology and the other was just plainly true. It was reality. And this is what he said in John 14. The same thing, but straight to the heart of the matter when he said this. To those whom he was sharing the word, of, the word of his word, the word of God the Father, he said here in verse uh, John fourteen verse twenty, at that day you shall know that I am in the Father and you in me and I in you. How do you know that? He said, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of what? my father and I will love him and will manifest myself to him Judas saith unto him not a scared Lord how is it that thou will manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world Jesus answered and said unto him if a man love me and again we read the same thing in Matthew we read the same thing Further up in John 14, 6, he says, If a man love me, he will keep my words. And we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not, keepeth not my sand. Is that not what he said also in Matthew about building your house on sand instead of on the rock? And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. Father God, I thank you for that. I thank you that your truth does not return void for those who are willing to hear and apply what they hear. Church, as I said Sunday, there's a power. There is power in the last words of someone, especially if they're inspired by God. I mentioned that before. Jesus naturally is the ultimate power and inspiration to us all when he said it is finished and it was finished meaning that he had done what he was called to do. He had defeated the enemy, the enemy of sin for those who come to him, those who trust him as Lord and Savior and that's what he was saying. But the victory was won but the battle is still waged. Why? Because we're still housed in our natural bodies. We're still in this world, even though we're not of the world. You see, our bodies now are challenged to become the temples of the Holy Spirit, where the holiness of God dwells, and that's what it is. And it's constantly, our flesh, the Word of God says in the book of James, you don't have to go there just yet, but it says that, that one spirit lusts against the other. Just like the book of Galatians says that the spirit of the flesh lusts against the spirit of God. 
So it doesn't change. And that's what I believe Joshua was saying. Serving the Lord is not something we do alone. It's who we are because we are his servants. Because of that, we are called to serve him. But we're to serve him in love. The word of God says in 1 John 4 that this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. Church, we are servants of him and we're called to serve him, but it is a, it must become our desire to serve him, our joy to serve him. And our old nature will fight us all the way. The more that you press in to serve God and not yourself, the more that your old nature will fight you. That's why we see the typology of Moses and his hands held up trusting God simultaneously. We see Aaron and her holding up his hands, but there's a staff and there's a rock behind him. That staff is held up. That's the authority of God's word. His hands are held up. That is Aaron, the, the royal priesthood, and her, meaning pure priesthood, holding Moses' hands up. But the thing is that he didn't just stand there and hold his hands up. He sent Joshua down to do battle against none other than Amalek, the Amalekites. Why? Because Joshua is the type and shadow of Jesus Christ. When Jesus said it was finished, God the Father sent Jesus to do battle on this earth for us on that cross. We know spirits are speaking that when we read about the Amalekites, we should think of our old sinful nature, flesh and Satan. Because the Amalekites and the descendants of Esau will sold their birthright for a morsel of bread, representing the power of of the desires of our flesh to seek gratification. And you can find that in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 16, where Paul talked about Esau and what he did and why he did what he did, because he served his flesh more than he did God. I'll read something to you quick if I can find it. I thought it was very, very interesting. Um, when I did research, I pulled some, com some commentaries that were very um, self-explaining. But it says the Amalekites, and this is spiritual application, the Amalekites, again, it's type and shadow, represent Satan in the flesh and their war against God's people and all that is right. Amalek was the grandson of, of Esau, Jacob's brother, Isaac's son. The Amalekites are the descendants of Esau the brother of Jacob, and you find that in Genesis chapter 36, verses 12 and 16. It also says by his sin, Esau's sin, he forfeited the birthright to his brother Jacob. So it stands that this lineage of Esau, including Amalek, his grandson, has forfeited the place of rulership to the seed of Jacob, which is Christ and his people. Did you hear what I just said? has forfeited the seed of Jacob, which is Christ, or forfeited to the seed of Jacob, which is Christ and his people. That's whom we are. Esau and Amalek are the type of Satan who was ousted by Jesus' redemption cross and lost his place of rulership over all who possess the born again birthright, being bought and paid for by the blood of the Lamb. You find this in Romans 5, verse 9, and 2 Corinthians. We use this often. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 15 through 21. And Colossians chapter 2, verses 14 through 19. And 1 Peter 1, verse 18 through 19. In my study, I saw where some of these commentators were in line with what the Holy Spirit had put in my heart spiritually. It said Esau walked in the flesh, and so he and his lineage are a type of the flesh, a type of sin under Satan's dominion and his influence. That's why I brought to your attention Romans 6, 16 through 23, because it says, whom you yield yourself servants to, you are servant to, you will obey. And he's talking to the people of God. Joshua said the same thing in our text. 
I'm saying the same thing to you and I tonight so that you understand that the battle that you and I fight will not get little or minimized. It will be greater as we press in to the mark of the high call of God in Christ Jesus to that promise. And you cannot minimize temptation in your life because you're older, you think you're over it. No, brothers and sisters. I think the most dangerous place to be is when you think that you cannot be tempted. I think pornography is widespread in the church and the house of God and believers' hearts. I think it's in their, their minds. It's, it's all over the place, whether it be on their phones or their laptops. Oh no, brothers, I'm not afraid to share the word of God as it is because we, as the body of Christ, need to be reminded that the battle is real. And it's not to some unseen power. It is a known power. Because you know the power of sin in your life. In our readings we saw. It was the first battle against the Israelites. And that's what we read Sunday. When they left Egypt and the world. You know why it was? Because you see. God's people were kept in slavery for over 400 years. God's people were oppressed for 400 years. So when they were released, they knew they didn't know nothing about nothing. They didn't know how to defend themselves. They didn't know how to take care of themselves. Just like the time of Esther, the Haman strove to remove their ability to defend themselves. Just like this. When the Israelites came out of Egypt, When's the best time to attack God's people? When they haven't learned how to walk in the authority of God's word. When they don't know how to walk in who they are now. When you walk in who you were in Egypt, in the world, you are still in bondage to sin. But when you are being freed, when you're walking in the authority of who you are, your birthright as a child of God, that's when the enemy wants to attack you, especially when you're not walking in the way that you should. That's why the Word of God says that Peter said that Satan is as a roaring lion, seeing whom he may devour. Amen. Satan doesn't want the world, he has the world. The first battle against the Israelites when they left Egypt slash the world, it was against the Amalekites. And it's still the ongoing battle that continues against God's people today. You and I. It's still ongoing because it's against our old nature. It is a perpetual test. And, and to whom we love the most, God or ourselves. Again, Romans 6, 16, attest to that. But so does Romans 8, 5 through 8. Go there to for me, please. Romans 8. The Word of God says, But they are after the flesh, do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. And again, if you look at 6.16 in Romans, it says, Know you not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey. If you yield yourself, your thoughts, to the old nature, then you are servant to your old nature, even though you were born again. And sooner or later, you will, the wages of that will be death. It says, whether you sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. It's the journey of sanctification, brothers and sisters. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, you know, <laughs> Paul makes reference to that in none other than the Feast of Passover in our born again experience, in our born in the beginning of our walk in salvation. 
1 Corinthians 5, he says here in verse 7 and 8, he says, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Now hold your plate, go to Joshua real quick for me in our reading text, Joshua 24. And I want you to read with me. Joshua 24. Look what he says here when he was referring to them in our reading text. He says now in verse 14 and 15, he says, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him how? In sincerity and truth. Did not Paul say the same thing? Hold your finger there and go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. He well said this, therefore let us keep the feast not with old leavened bread, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with unleavened bread of what? Sincerity. Of sincerity and what? Truth. Is that not the same thing that Joshua spoke to the people of God when they entered into the covenant promise of God? You gotta understand, this is not before they cross over into the promised land. This is after they cross over into the promised land. Just like us. What I'm telling you is not because you're not believers, but because you are believers. I want to warn you about the sheer magnitude of the battle that is against you and I. And what the main culprit is. Satan has to have a platform to work off of. If he doesn't have a platform to work off of, he can't work. And the only door he has to work in is your own nature. He can't touch that that is holy. He can't cross over the bloodline. But you can cross over the bloodline of your old natural man. That's why the Lord God told Moses, tell the people to stay behind the blood or in the house. Church, my notes for this study on Amalek and the parallel and paralleling of our daily battle against our old nature, spiritually speaking, or perpetual. And I believe it's a perpetual battle. And I believe it's represented in what I shared with you earlier. Amalek represents our broader threefold enemy, the world, the flesh, and the devil. And we're engaged in a uh, perpetual spiritual warfare against the enemies of our souls. It is. And you cannot turn a blind eye to that. If you compromise with your old nature, you will lose the battle. They will eventually dominate your life and if left unattended to and dealt with, they will destroy you. Israel had to drink from the rock. Remember what we talked about in 1 Corinthians 10. They had to drink from the rock, which is Christ. But then they had to take up their swords and actively fight this enemy. Didn't they? Didn't the Israelites have to fight against Amalekites? Amalekites? Well, what makes you think that you and I don't? We drink from the spiritual drink the same as they did. He well uh, equivalates that to it. But when you look at what they did, Moses was up holding his hands. You had the royal priesthood. You had Aaron representing the priesthood, her representing the purity of it. And yet you have Joshua leading the army to discomfort, if you will, the enemy of Amalekites. And there's a threefold battle stage here. The authority of God's word is the victory. But the battle has to be fought on the ground, so to speak. Do you know that the Amalekites were dwellers of the valleys? I find that interesting. The Amalekites lived in the desert south of Canaan around Kadesh. You find that if you're interested in, in Genesis 14, 7. 
otherwise known as the northern part of the Gev. Amalek was the son of Elphaz, Esau's eldest boy by a concubine named Timnah. Genesis 36, 12. And became a clan or a chief in the tribe of Esau. Genesis 36, 15. The Amalekites were distant cousins to the Israelites. The Lord, the Bible says in Exodus 17, 16, the Lord has sworn the Lord will have war against Amalek from generation to generation. Church, we must use considerable caution when we deal with our flesh. Your flesh, my flesh, is very deceiving and doesn't settle for a little bit, it wants a lot of it. And it will have, you open up a door and it will come rushing in. And it is good at that because it's had practice. <laughs> it's had a lot of practice. Amalekites, Amalek, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin and the death or of obedience unto righteousness, which is the same for every believer today. The flesh must daily and perpetually be crucified, and you can't crucify it. I mean, somebody else can't crucify it for you. You've got to crucify it. It must be perpetually crucified as we follow Christ and also in order to continue to follow Christ. The Word of God says that in Luke 9, 23 and 24. The Bible says also the Lord will have war with Amalek, these are types of challenges for today, for us. I believe that's what Joshua's last words to all of God's people was exactly that. What I'm sharing with us today and for today's times is for the same reason. Just like Haman in the book of Esther. He was driven to destroy the people of God. Guess where his ancestry takes him back to? It was all the way back to Agag. Y'all remember who Agag was? Agag was the king of the Amalek, Amalekites, whom God told the prophet to tell Saul to utterly destroy, but he spared him. And because of that, God removed Saul's kingdom from him. Sound familiar? He chose to gratify his flesh. It says that Saul was like a new man, a type and shadow being born again. It says that he had a new heart, a new spirit about him. He was like a new man. He prophesied. He did all these things. And yet he turned right around and he wouldn't hearken to the voice of God. He rebelled against that. He, he justified that. And God took the kingdom from him. Very much so like God removed the birthright of Esau because Esau chose to gratify his flesh but so did Saul. Saul chose the best uh, cattle and the best uh, things that he took from them for him and the people. He wanted to take care of his flesh. And God said, fine, that's what you choose. I'm taking the kingdom from you. Just like Haman, just like Saul. Yes, brothers and sisters, it is, a, it is spiritual in context, just like what Paul talked about in Ephesians 6.12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against power, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. You see, we see it all through history. And we've been warned all through history. We saw it with Napoleon. We saw it with Hitler. We are seeing it today and we'll see it at the end of the days. Different faces but the same spirit. Choose you this day whom you will serve. It requires the same answer that Joshua answered when he said, but it's for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. He's referring to who he is and how he lives. The flesh is not going away, brothers and sisters. Don't you understand that? Your flesh is not going away until we are going away to heaven. Just as God's people in the Old Testament had war with Amalek for 
generation to generation. So the people of God under the New Testament have war daily, even though, even though God has granted us grace, divine empowering to win. It's only through the cross applied in our lives that that happens. We still must choose to mortify the deeds of our flesh. The word of God, and I read earlier in Romans 8, 13, 14 says, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, again, he says this again, you shall die, but if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. Church, these are things that as I come to a place of closing that you and I need to think on. Ask yourself, what has changed from then to now? We were saved out of the world in Egypt just like God's church in the wilderness, but by grace through faith. Yet we're still in the world, even though not of it, like they were. And they had to battle continuously against the flesh, the old nature. But to win over the old nature, they had to choose who they would serve, just like us today, daily, as his people. We must choose daily whose report we believe and who will we serve daily. The critical issues that I see for all of us that affects us daily as God's people are the same that Joshua was sharing with God's people. Then is still here today. It's for us to stand firm in who we will serve no matter what we face. You know, it reminds me, Joshua talked about maintaining our obedience to the Lord just like I'm talking about now. Because we must be grateful at all times for what he has done. But in doing that, that's what should propel our obedience, our gratitude, our love for him. Not bondage, as I said Sunday, not legalism. Joshua had learned in his own personal experience that the Lord gave them the victory only when they obeyed him. Remember? Remember when he crossed over? Remember when Jericho, the wall of Jericho fell? It's because they obeyed him every ten and, and, dot, and dot, every way they obeyed him. But what happened when they didn't? It just took a handful of villagers to turn them away, to over or defeat them. Just took a handful because one decided not to obey. The Bible says even in this, in Hebrews chapter 7 verses 11, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death. And I'm talking about Jesus here. And was heard, and that he feared, though he were the son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. He was tempted like we, but he said not. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation. And it's very simple how he says it, Brother Brian. He became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. And that's not when you first come to the Lord. It's not in the middle of your walk. It's not just before the end of your walk. It's daily. When you choose this day for yourselves, whom you will serve. Brothers and sisters, as I close tonight, I want us to remember these four things. To overcome the Amalek, the old nature that is always, always sitting underneath your table like a lap dog. Always waiting for you to drop something on the floor. You know how fast they pick that up. Huh? That's kind of like our flesh. It's always waiting for us to drop something on the floor. It's always waiting for us to... I'll never forget, we had a dog named Joby. He, go, uh, he was a um, boxer. And then when I had taken out this ham one day, I don't know if it was a Thanksgiving. Was it Thanksgiving or 
I'd put it on the on the table and I felt sure that he couldn't get a hold of that. And I went in the room and I was coming back to carve that rascal and he had that old hand in his mouth. That's what happens when we turn the blind eye to that old nature and don't want to bite. I couldn't pry that thing from his teeth for nothing. And I definitely gave it to him. We must stay in the word of God as our lifeline. We must stay grounded in the word of God as our strength. We must stay and remain pure as a holy people unto God because we can by grace and faith. And we must keep our eyes fixed on Jesus and run our race. Our part is always to cast down every heavy weight and besetting sin. Our part is to remember that we will have war against Amalekites, against Amalek, the spirit of Amalek in our lives. The more that we press in to the high call of God or the prize of Christ Jesus in our lives. The word of God given to us just like the life of God given to us is free. But the condition is that we protect that gift from Amalek, from the Amalekites. Choose this day for yourselves whom you will serve. It starts with a committed heart to serve the Lord out of love, no matter who does or doesn't, and it ends the same way. It's about today who we choose to serve words of cheap, but we must continue through action to serve the Lord daily. Because the truth, the simple truth is, if you don't serve the Lord, you serve self. And if you serve self, you are and will be destroyed by your own Amalek, your own flesh will oppress you, but it doesn't have to subdue you. That's your choice. Amalek, your old nature, Sister Jan, will oppress you till you leave this earth, but it does not have to subdue you. You need to bring it under subjection. The Word of God says, Bring every thought, everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. That you bring every thought, not just into captivity, but unto the obedience unto Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, I close with this. It's about saying no to yourself, your flesh, no to the world, and more emphatically than ever, and more decisively than Yes to God, who by his own oath declares unto us, who commit and keep committing our lives unto his service. He says, be strong and of good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he it is that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee nor forsake thee. The question today for you and I is who will we serve this day. Will we serve our flesh or the Lord our God? Again, as I close, I love what Peter said. He said, Lord, to whom shall we go? When Jesus says, will you leave me too? Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Father God, you told us and you remind us that the spirit of Amalek is our whole nature. It is Satan and the Amalekites and all that attack our spiritual man, the new man, is from the old nature, from the spirit of the fallen man. It includes our own nature, 
and includes the world and is spearheaded by Satan. But Father God, we're not of the Amalekites. We're not under Amalek. We're under Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. And this day we choose to serve none other than Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. And all the people of God said, Amen. Would you give God all the glory?